Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal from the Continuing Church of God. What I'd like to do today is talk about prayer. Now, this is the second part of a two-part series we've done on prayer. We're going over 28 tips that the Bible gives us as far as prayer goes. Now, in this particular sermon, I do want to cover a little bit more in terms of healing. I also want to cover how to deal with the impossible or the difficult. And, and again, go over again what the Bible teaches about prayer. Now, at the end, I'll go over the prior uh, 14 tips, but now I'm going to start with number 15. Pray for what the Bible says to pray about. Now, that sounds like a radical concept. It sounds like a simple concept. But people have their, their own conception about prayer. People think they should pray for what they want, their way, because that's what they want. Well, if you want your prayers to be more effective, since you're talking to God, perhaps you should ask what God, for what God wants you to ask for. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, I pray and I'm not sure what God's will is. I know God will answer my prayer if it's according to His will. Well, if you pray for what God tells you to pray for, you can be pretty sure that what you're praying for is in accordance with God's will. Now, go to the book of James, uh, James chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 5. And I'm mainly going to be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. But otherwise, I'll tell you, at least I hope to tell you if I'm going to read from something else. Uh, so wisdom is one of the things that the Bible says to pray for. James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Notice what it says. If you lack wisdom, ask of God, and it will be given. It's not like, if you ask God for wisdom, God's going to say, no, I don't want you to be wiser. I'm not going to give you this. It's not my will. James says it is God's will, and God will do this. If you want your prayers to be heard, want to be sure your prayers are being heard, one of the things you should do is pray for what the Bible says, and one of them is wisdom. It's most certainly God's will that you get some. You should also pray for discernment and understanding. And we're going to go to the book of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. Proverbs 2, verse 3. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The Proverbs were being told, look, if you look for discernment and understanding like you would for hidden treasure... You'll get the fear of the Lord, and you'll find the knowledge of God. So if you're diligent, and you go for what God wants you to go for, you'll get it. Now in Psalm uh, uh, 119, verse 169, I'll just read this. It says, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Now God promises discernment and understanding according to his word. He'll grant understanding, and He'll allow you to find the knowledge of God. Of course, some people, that's not what they want to pray about. They just want to pray about their physical needs, or to get out of some trouble, or whatever. Now, the book of Colossians, chapter 1, you, there exists an idea of something the Apostle Paul prayed for, which is, so is that others will have wisdom and spiritual understanding. Yeah, others. You're not just supposed to pray for it for yourself. You're supposed to pray for others. Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So notice, Paul is praying that they would have wisdom and they would increase the knowledge of God. Now I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 9 and read something else that the Bible says to pray for. Matter of fact, this is from Jesus. He said to his disciples, Matthew uh, 9 verse 37, The harvest is truly plentiful and the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers to his harvest. 
that you're praying for the work. Now I'd like to go to uh, Colossians again, this time Colossians chapter 4. And starting in verse 2, uh, Colossians 4 says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. The work of God is important. You're supposed to pray for it. But this tip, the first tip of this sermon, still holds true. Pray for what God says to pray for. That way you'll know that God will hear you. Now tip 16 is to pray for spiritual gifts. I'm going to go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. There's different types of spiritual gifts to pray for. In my own normal morning prayer, I tend to pray that I might have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which are gifts of the Spirit according to Galatians. I also add uh, wisdom and understanding as well as to be a, a, a proper example and a witness to that list. Now, going to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm only going to read one verse here. I also pray as Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now, that doesn't mean that all are going to become prophets, or that all will prophesy, though it concludes that some will, but that we all need to pursue love and spiritual gifts. It also means that God will use, use us to speak rightly on His behalf when we should. You can also consider 1 Peter 3.15 on that. And by the way, the scriptures that I'm going through are in uh, the upcoming booklet, the new booklet we have uh, on prayer. Uh, so if I go too quickly, or you want to... To look something up again, uh, you, can, you can get information on it there. So most of the scriptures I'm going to cover are in there. Now I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 12. And I'm going to spend uh, uh, some time uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, so you might want to go over there and follow along. Spiritual gifts do vary, but love is what we need. So Colossians 2, starting verse, excuse me, not Colossians. 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. There are different spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, yet the same Lord is served. There's different types of work to do, but the same God produces every gift in every person. So there's different tasks that have to be done, and you perhaps have a different role than somebody else, but the work still needs to be done. And hopefully you're part of it. Verse 7. The evidence of the Spirit's presence is given to each person for the common good of everyone. So the spiritual gifts that you are given aren't just for you, it's supposed to be for the common good of everyone. Verse 8. The Spirit gives one person the ability to speak with wisdom. The same Spirit gives another person... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the God's Word translation. I, said, I tried to remember to tell you that. I was reading a different one. The same Spirit gives another person the ability to speak with knowledge. To another person, the same Spirit gives courageous faith. To another person, the same Spirit gives the ability to heal. Another can work miracles. Another can speak what God has revealed. Another can tell the difference between spirits. Another can speak in different kinds of languages. Another can interpret languages. Verse 11. There is only one Spirit who does all these things by giving what God wants to give to each person. So you see that everybody's different. So be careful that you understand that your strengths, how you can help the common good or, or the work may be unique. They might be different from somebody else's. Languages were mentioned. We have several people, quite a few actually, who volunteer to translate our literature into multiple languages. I presume, for example, this prayer booklet will get translated into other languages. I don't know how many, but I probably will. That's certainly not a skill that I have. Uh, some are better editors. Uh, we've had this booklet edited uh, by uh, somebody in the U.S. and somebody in, uh, in New Zealand. 
Uh, there's all kinds of different gifts uh, that are out there. And you may, you may have something different than everybody else. You may wonder how your gift will work, but all things will work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. And your prayer and your spiritual gifts are not just for yourself. Now I'm going to go back to the New King James, this time uh, verse 27 of 1 Corinthians uh, 12. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in His church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles and the gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? The answer is, of course, not. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I will show you a more excellent way. So Paul says you're supposed to desire spiritual gifts, but there's something, there's a more excellent way. There's something that's more important that you need to be careful about. A lot of people want to do miracles, uh, make great prophecies, and people will think they're some great one. But notice what the Apostle Paul says is more important to God. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm going to start with verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. Even if you have the faith to move mountains, Paul says, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. You say, oh, if I have the faith to move mountains, I'm a great one, I am the great one. Uh, if you don't have love, Paul says, it's nothing. And people don't seem to want to pursue love. Now, we're all supposed to pray to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it says in 2 Peter 3.18. But the amount that we grow is going to vary. We all have different roles and gifts. Now, the Bible says that God did not call many who are wise, mighty, or noble in this age, even though we're supposed to pray for wisdom. But he said he would grant those gifts, such as wisdom. Now, the Bible also says an important part of his work is going to be done by his Spirit. You can read about that in Zechariah uh, 4, verses 6 through 7. Pray for spiritual gifts. Never forget that love is the most important spiritual gift. Do you really pray for love? Think about it. So that leads to tip number 17. Don't pray for show. Many seem to wish to pray to be seen by others. I've seen various evangelicals somewhat dance around with their hands in the air like this to raise, so somehow indicate that they're praying or somehow they're worshiping God. I've also witnessed people crawling on their knees on pavement in places like Fatima, Portugal. Maybe they're praying. They're doing this as supposedly for their worship for God. Although it seems kind of an outward show to me. Now, if you go to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, we're going to read uh, something from Jesus. Because he warned about praying for show. Matthew 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they've had their reward. Wonders about some people who do certain things for show in public. Verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut the door, pray to your Father who's in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You pray to draw closer to God, not to impress others. It's not there isn't a time for public prayer. Because biblically there are. But we're not to pray to impress others. Now, while I'm not opposed to uh, uh, people praying out loud at meals, and I've done this from time to time I feel appropriate, normally I privately thank God for my meals in the silent prayer. Uh, so, in case you wonder if, uh, about prayer in restaurants, uh, small restaurant settings, I generally don't recommend that. Now, if it's a big group church thing going on, that would be a bit different. But otherwise, I would tend to say that it's not necessary. And again, you can all pray privately. Now, public prayer 
at the beginning or the end of uh, church services is not for outward show. Uh, the short, short prayer should get the mind of the prayer and the listeners better focused on the service. And Jesus says, when two or more are gathered in his name, he's there. And uh, uh, hopefully, by praying and reminding everybody of that, that Jesus will be present. So that's one reason uh, we would pray that way. Now the next one is an interesting one, or a different kind of one. Tip 18. Obey what the New Testament teaches about head coverings. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Do the coverings or uncovering your head make any difference? Well, it does according to the Apostle Paul. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 1, he said, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Okay, then he goes into, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep your traditions just as I deliver them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So he's starting to go through authority here. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, for one, for that is one is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. For it's shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. So women are not supposed to go and make themselves bald. Verse 7, For man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, the woman, woman ought to have a symbol of authority over her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For the woman came from man, even so the man also comes from the woman. Verse 13. Judge among yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. For if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her as a covering. Now, I'm going to comment here. Some people sometimes feel that this means women have to wear veils, but you can see here it says the hair, a woman's hair was given to her for covering. And if anyone seems contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the Church of God. We don't have a different custom. We do not require women to wear veils. Women do not have to wear veils or, or hats when they go to church services. But they should have long hair. That's what this is talking about. Now, while this is talking about hair, this also seems to be prohibiting males from wearing hats or other head coverings when they're praying in public. Now, I want to say, if you're outside and it's cold and you're a man wearing a hat, I mean, if you need to pray, especially silently, I mean, that, 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 that's fine. And I also think uh, women are allowed to wear hats or veils if, if, if they want to pray, when they pray. Now, males should have relatively short hair and not wear hair coverings while they're praying, and women should have relatively long hair. And they can, but they're not required to wear hats or veils or something when it's praying. Now, it's true that the ancient Levitical priesthood had uh, head coverings, but the Bible shows that there was a change in the priesthood. You can read about that in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, especially like verse 12. Now, it should be understood that neither Jesus nor the Apostle Paul wore head coverings when they're praying. And remember, the Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians 1, I mean 11, verse 1, to imitate him as he imitated Jesus. According to the uh, encyclopedia, Catholic Encyclopedia, the type of head coverings that you see the Greco-Roman priests and bishops wear, uh, they didn't even become part of their churches until the 4th century arrival of uh, Emperor Constantine, who was a devotee of the sun god Mithras. Many of the religious head coverings that we see in the 21st century come from pagan practices. Um, I don't know how well this is going to show up here, but let me make a stab at it. It's in, this is in the book. If you can see, if you look toward the right, oh, see, my right would be your left, sorry. Toward the left, which would be right here. You can see 
a priest of the sun god Mithras. Notice the type of head covering that he's wearing. Uh, now, if you go toward the middle, you'll see a Pope Leo. And Pope Leo, this is, he was Pope around 440, so in the 5th century. And then over uh, to, to my left, your right, is a picture that my wife Joyce took of uh, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth in St. Peter's Basilica over in the Vatican City. Now, when you go through the Vatican, you'll see that the apostles and the early leaders they have statues of there do not have these type of head coverings on them. Oh, well, why? Partially because the Roman Catholic scholars know that nobody wore head coverings, not until the time of Emperor Constantine. After the time of Emperor Constantine, you can start to see head coverings popping up. But notice that they resemble head covering from the sun, sun god Mithras. And some of the hats that I've seen or head coverings look uh, I, pretty much identical to this particular one. And yes, we also will see head coverings uh, of the bishops of Rome and uh, I think the Eastern Orthodox as well that uh, look like they came from the pagan uh, fish god Dagon, from, uh, which also came from ancient Babylon. But basically, the Greco-Roman churches adopted head coverings after they were exposed to Emperor Constantine, who was a devotee of the sun god Mithras. Even the term Mitra, Mitra uh, which is a name for a hat, uh, seems to possibly also come from uh, the sun god Mithras. Now, if you see males praying with head coverings like the pagans wore, you can be assured that these males do not believe they have to take 1 Corinthians 11 literally. But they should and you should as well. I also should mention the type of uh, baldness that Buddhist and Catholic monks have imposed on themselves at time when they do this tonsure, as they call it. It's directly contrary to statutes of the Bible. You can look that up in Leviticus 21, 1, through 5, 1 and 5, Ezekiel uh, 44, 15 through 20. So be careful you don't imitate them. That's not what God wants you to do. Tip number 19. As far as prayer goes, ask often, but don't use vain repetitions, but be fervent. Now let's go to uh, Luke chapter 18. Jesus encouraged asking God for things frequently. Uh, Luke 18, starting in verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So sometimes people pray and they lose heart. It's like, okay, God, I prayed for this. You didn't do it. I prayed for it. I keep praying. I've given up. I've lost heart. Jesus told this so you wouldn't give up. So there was a, in a certain city a judge. He didn't fear God and he didn't, nor regard man. There was a widow in the city. She came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he wouldn't for a while, but afterwards he thought, Though I don't fear God nor regard man, yet because this woman troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So in other words, he says, This woman's bothering me all the time. I don't really care about her issue. I don't care about God either, but just to get rid of her, I'm going to do something. I'll, I'll deal as she wants. Verse 6, Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? We're getting close to the time when the Son of Man is supposed to come. Will he really find faith? Do you really have faith? Do you believe God? Will you be persistent in your prayers? Many really don't have the type of faith that they should. Uh, we have a booklet uh, on this, Faith for Those That God Has Called and Chosen, uh, that may, may, you might find helpful. Now, although we're supposed to pray regularly, Jesus also warned against the type of vain repetitions that uh, the heathen have. This will be from Matthew chapter 6 I'm going to read. Matthew 6, starting in verse 7, Jesus said, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, 
For they think they'll be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So while the outline of prayer Jesus gave in Matthew 6, 9-13 through 13, gives us priorities and certain specifics to pray about, true Christians don't just repeat those words in row, multiple times in row, as some faiths who profess Christ do. Now, did you know that in some cultures, they actually spin a wheel, and they believe that each rotation is a prayer to their God? And at one place in Asia, I recall seeing prayers <laughs> on a wheel spun by the wind. That's not what God wants. So yeah, they figure, okay, here's how we're going to beseech God. I'm going to build something. I'm going to, they write a prayer on it, it's got some kind of a wing or fan blade. So the wind hits it, spins around, and they consider that they're praying to God every single time. <laughs> it's vain repetition, amongst other things. It's certainly not sincere prayer, and it's certainly not showing a true faith in God. If you won't give God the time of day to do it, <laughs> you must not have that much confidence in, in God. Now, still others in Eastern and Western cultures use beads, to keep track of uh, the re repetition that they uh, do, so they keep keep track of their prayer, but that's also not what God wants. Now, I saw a Catholic priest on television, and they were talking about praying the rosary, and he said, well, some people come up to me and say, priest, whatever, I'm sure they called him father or something or other, uh, I'm just saying this in rote. It's just like I'm just mumbling the words. Surely that God doesn't want me to do it that way. And this priest on TV says, Look, most people won't even do that. God is pleased that you're willing to make some effort. The fact that, you know, as long as you just say the words, God's pleased. You know, you don't pray. God's not looking for false prayers. He wants fervent, effectual prayers. He's not talking about just rote memorization. Jesus says, don't do this. But you've got people in the Church of Rome and other churches and, and uh, the heathen faiths, uh, the Eastern faiths, they do this. The Bible says don't do it. We're supposed to make our uh, petitions to God clear. Now if you go to James 5, I'm going to read what uh, something God wants us to do. James 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. The rosary prayers isn't particularly praying for others. Uh, basically, they do what they call the Our Father and the Hail Mary. And uh, it's not particularly specific to others. I'll just leave it at that. Anyway, it says, Pray for one another that you may be healed. Okay, so now we're starting to see healing brought in here. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We're well, not being effective or fervent if you're just doing rote memorization based on beads or having written prayers that spin around with the wind. Verse 17, Elijah, he was a man with a nature like ours. So sometimes people look at the Old Testament or even the New Testament and say, ah, Elijah, he was this great man, he was just so different than we were or Paul, or Peter, or whatever. But it says, no, Elijah was just like us. And he prayed earnestly, it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain in the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. God doesn't want vain repetition. He wants prayers that are truly effectual. In Hosea 7.14, you don't need to go there. It says, God wants His people to cry out to me with their heart. Not just mumble, mutter some words. In Luke 22, verse 44, I'm going to read something that Jesus did. The account in Luke says, In being in agony, He, that's Jesus, prayed more earnestly than sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus was quite fervent in his prayer various times as that, that shows. He wasn't doing rote memorization and vain repetition. Verse 20. If you're sick, pray about it. We're going to go to James again. 5. 
Now we were just in James uh, a minute or two ago. I'm going to go back up a few verses to verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. So here again, under pray for what God wants, it says, or James was inspired to write, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. So if you're suffering, you're supposed to pray about it. So you want to know what God's will is? God's will is for you to pray about it. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. One of the reasons why in church services we recommend that you start off with a, a song from our songbook, most of which are psalms. Verse 14, is any one of you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Sometimes illness is a result of sin, and sometimes it's not. Or at least not obvious sins. Now in Ecclesiastes 3.3 3, it says there's a time to heal, so pray for it. Those who are uh, uh, ill can also call for the elders to appoint, to anoint them. Now, 1 Peter 2 tells us that we're healed by the stripes of Jesus. Uh, 1 Peter 2, I'll read verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we might that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed it's by Jesus' stripes we were healed Jesus took a beating for you so you could be healed God would want you to be healed sometimes God wants you to wait on it and I'll get to that later but Jesus took a beating so you could be healed now Moses prayed that God would heal his uh, sister Miriam in Numbers. And in Psalm 35, uh, David prayed and fasted when others were sick. I'd like to read that. Psalm uh, 35, verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I humbled myself with fasting. See, just doing rote memorization of prayer isn't humbling yourself. Humbling yourself with fasting says, Hey God, I have a petition. Here's what I want. But I know uh, I've sinned. I've got problems. I need to uh, get closer to you. So I'm going to humble myself with fasting, which is what, uh, what David did. Now, in uh, 2 Kings 20, verse 5, you don't have to go over there, but God told uh, Isaiah to tell Hezekiah that God was going to heal Hezekiah because God heard Hezekiah's prayer. The Bible says that God heals. I'll read Psalm 30, verse 2, just the one verse here. It says, O Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. Uh, Jeremiah 7, 14 says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Prayer is connected with healing in the Bible. When you're suffering, remember to pray. Tip 21. Pray for church leaders. We're supposed to pray for spiritual leaders. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.25, Paul says, Brethren, pray for us. I'd like to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and read a couple of verses. Second Thessalonians uh, 3, starting verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have the faith. So notice Paul says to pray for us, he means the spiritual leaders, that the word of the Lord might run swiftly and be glorified so they will do the job right, God will get glory, his word will go out there, and also to be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. 
to pray for his protection. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, I'm going to read something. Christian leaders said, Pray for us. We are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. So, uh, true Christian leaders do desire to live uh, honorably. And we need to be prayed for. Now, I read the, an account in Matthew, so you don't have to go to the Luke account, but I'm going to read from Luke's account, Luke chapter 10, verse 2, something I read a little earlier. The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers to his harvest. We need more laborers. Uh, we've got leaders scattered throughout the world. We need more. We need more laborers to the harvest. Jesus said to pray for that. Do you do that? And as Acts 21, 14, we're supposed to pray that the will of the Lord be done. Pray for what God says to pray for. Pray for His work. Now tip 22 is to pray for secular leaders. In the New Testament and the Old Testament, some leaders uh, asked God's people to pray for them. And they did. For example, in the Old Testament, you can read about it in uh, 1 Kings 13, 6 and Ezra 6, uh, 8-10. Well, in the New Testament... I'd like to go to 1 Timothy, chapter 2. Now, some people in the world believe that the problems of humanity would be best solved by voting uh, or, uh, or rioting, I guess. I've seen that uh, lately, uh, which is certainly not the solution. The Bible says we need to pray for our secular leaders and those in government who have authority over our lives. So in uh, 1 Timothy 2, starting verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence, this, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior. So notice we're supposed to pray for physical leaders, those in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life, hence I made my comment about rioting, in all godliness and reverence. Many of us face complications with government officials and their policies, no matter where you are on this planet. Uh, human governments have issues. Are you praying for your human leaders like you should? Tip 23. Put Jesus in your prayers. According to Acts uh, 4, verses 10 through 12, there's only one name under heaven by which we can be saved, and that's Jesus. We need to put Jesus into our prayers. Now that doesn't mean we're supposed to be mainly to pray to Jesus, but, but that can be done, as you can see in Acts uh, 7.59. But we need to realize that we can come to the Father because of what Jesus did for us. I'd like you to go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4, starting in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are without sin. This is a re reference also to false leaders. I mean, we have people out there who believe there are, there are some uh, high priest human that they're supposed to be going through now uh, with various titles. A bridge, build, bridge builder, which is uh, what a pontifex uh, is supposed to be. But this says that we have a high priest who was without sin, and that's Jesus, and all humans of other humans of sin. Therefore, let us go boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. We can boldly go before throne of grace to obtain mercy. So we're supposed to do this. Pray for what God says to pray for, or the Bible teaches you to pray for. We can and should come boldly to the uh, throne of grace because of Jesus. 
Now, we're going to go to uh, John 14. And you don't need to, to go there. It won't be here too long. In John 14, verse 13, Jesus taught, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So we should pray in Jesus' name. Now, are there limits? I'd like you to go to Philippians. The two verses I'm going to read in Philippians are actually shorter than what I just read in John. I didn't tell you it needed to go to John, but I do want you to go to Philippians 4. Because Philippians 4, verse 13, I believe, is, a, is another point uh, that, that you need to understand. Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. Philippians 2, 5, it says, Let this mind be you which was in Christ Jesus. And I said before, read before from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, imitate him as he imitated Christ. So it says, the mind of Christ, and realize that we can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens us. Now, if you've repented, been baptized, received God's Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus has washed you clean. You can see that in Revelation 1, 5. If you truly imitate Jesus, you can do all things through him. Try to be and think like Jesus. John 16, 23. Let me read this one verse here. Apostle John wrote, Most assuredly, this is what Jesus said, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Now tip number one was to pray to the Father. And Jesus says here to pray and ask the Father in his name. Because of his sacrifice, we should pray, ask the Father in Jesus' name authority. I normally close prayers asking for all that I prayed for by the name or the authority of Jesus Christ in accordance with God's will. Now, Jesus is the only mediator between humankind and God, as it says in uh, uh, 1 Timothy uh, 2, verse 5. And we're not supposed to pray through Jesus' mother or any other ones. Now, there are some matters that are somewhat, that are very difficult. And that's got to do with, so we're going to get to that in tip 24 here. When you've got the difficult, remember fasting. Now go over to uh, Mark chapter uh, 9. I'm going to start in verse 17, and I'm going to be in this section for a while. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a moot spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, but they couldn't. Verse 19, he answered him and said, O faithless generation, so he's talking to the apostles, fear as faithless, amongst others, how long shall I be with you? How long will I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground, and swallowed foaming at the mouth. Verse 21. So he, that's Jesus, asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said to him, From childhood. And often he was thrown in the water, both into the fire and into the water, to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on him and help us. Verse 23, and Jesus said, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Verse 24, Immediately the father of the child cried out with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Verse 25. When Jesus saw the people running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, dumb and deaf, should be deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. Then he became as one dead. So many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he come into his house, his, as Jesus' disciples, asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Verse 29. So he, Jesus, said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Fasting is an adjunct to prayer. Difficult situations need fasting along with prayer. 
And once there was a problem with the children of, uh, with the tribe of Benjamin, the children of Israel took military steps against them. And the children of Israel suffered greatly for a while. It happened to them a couple different times. And they cried to God, you sure you want us to do this? And God said yes. So finally they took steps, including fasting, and they were victorious. So sometimes, even when requests are consistent with God's will, God doesn't answer immediately, and fasting can be helpful. In the book of Nehemiah, we see that when Nehemiah heard about the terrible conditions in Jerusalem, how they were, he prayed about it. Nehemiah 1 verse 4. He was the only person who brought the king things to drink. Now, he was only a person. I mean, that was his job. He was just... He's just the cupbearer for the king. He wasn't some great one. Yet after prayer and fasting, he later became governor of Judah. Uh, the people in Jerusalem were in a difficult way, and God provided relief through one who prayed and fasted. Now I'd like to go to Isaiah. Isaiah 58. Starting verse 6. Is this not the fast I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall bring forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. You shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say to you, Here I am. You take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the spreading wickedness. If you extend your soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall, shall, shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as noonday. So it comes to difficult problems. Don't forget fasting. The Bible recommends it. Tip 25. Pray with thanksgiving. I'm going to go to, the Psalm, to Psalm 107. You're supposed to thank God in your prayers. This is something God wants you to do. In Psalm 107, starting in verse 8. And these are actually lyrics to one of the songs in our songbook. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of men, for He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. I'm going to go through a few more verses on Thanksgiving. Uh, that you don't need to turn to. You can jot them down, or you can you can look in the uh, in the booklet. Uh, Ephesians 5:20, 20, 21. It says, "Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ." Remember, we're supposed to pray the Father in the name or the authority of Jesus Christ. It says it again, submitting to one another in the fear of God. First Corinthians 15:57 says. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17 And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Hebrews 13.15 Therefore, by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to God. Psalm 116, verse 17. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the last one I want to talk about here is Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let's think about that. Philippians 4, 6. It's almost a summary of a lot of what we've been talking about. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Supposed to pray with thanksgiving, bring things to God. And some of these other ones I said, I just read, talked about doing this in Jesus' name and to the Father. Now, does God want you to thank Him or praise Him because His ego requires it? No. Many people don't understand a lot about God. He wants you to do this because it's best for you. How? You should realize your sins hurt not only you, 
but others. Despite this, as it says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, whosoever believes in Him will not perish and have everlasting life. God sent His Son to die for you. God provides for you. The truth is you should be grateful. All of us should be. In addition to being grateful for your calling, your spiritual blessings, your life, your physical blessings, the book of Psalms is full of specific items you should be thankful for. You might want to uh, read that over looking for some ideas on being thankful. Tip 26. Deal with secret sins. Sometimes you have sins that are in the way, including secret ones. It says in Psalm uh, 66, verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. I'd like to go to Isaiah 59, starting verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. So God can still hear you. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now some do a good job of hiding their sins from others. Some even hide sins from themselves. But God knows. In Psalm 69.5 it says, O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. So God knows your sins, and if you know them, you should confess them. Psalm 90, starting verse 7, it says, For we've been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. God knows. God's, God will allow you to face tests and trials to purge you of these sins, known and unknown. I'm going to go to James chapter 1. Now the tests and trials that we have to go through don't seem like a lot of fun. James 1, starting in verse 2. My brethren, count it in all joy. Read that again. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may perfect, be perfect, incomplete, lacking nothing. We're supposed to strive to be perfect in God's sight, not ours. And Jesus taught that we're supposed to be perfect just as our Father is perfect in Matthew 5, 48. We can't hide our sins from God and we should strive not to hide our sins from ourselves. Lamentations. I'd like to read a couple verses from Lamentations chapter 3. Starting in verse 39. Lamentations 3 verse 39. Why should a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search out and examine our ways, turn back to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to, the, to God in heaven. So we see in the Old Testament, we're supposed to examine ourselves and uh, not complain about the trials we get to purchase the sins. Now I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 11, because the New Testament also has a similar concept. Uh, this is talking about uh, uh, the Passover, but it's, it's more than just that. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, starting verse 27. It says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So this is the part related to Passover, but notice verse 28. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats or drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you. Now it doesn't say for this reason, that's why everybody's sick. This is why many are sick and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we would, may not be condemned of the world. We're supposed to judge ourselves. If we do this, then God won't have to judge us. But people don't tend to believe this. We tend to think that our problems are all physical, they all need a physical solution, and so we pray for physical things a lot of, a lot of times. Now that doesn't mean to neglect the physical, but understand that there are spiritual issues. 
Proverbs 3, verses 7 through 8 says, Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Isaiah 55, verses 2 and 3. Listen carefully, carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come. Here and your soul shall live. So we saw something physically here. You're supposed to listen to God, number one, but you're also supposed to eat what's good. Uh, many of you don't do that. Or not, don't do it often enough. Uh, in 1 Timothy 4, 7, it says you... Let me just, let's, let's just go there. I was going to skip over that, but let's read it. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For, God, for bodily exercise profits a little bit. So it's, it's fine exercise. I t uh, tend to exercise about four days a week, a little bit. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of life that now is and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. These things command and teach. So I'm trying to teach those now. Examine yourself and change. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, it says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he falls. So if you think you don't have problems, you better consider what the Bible says. All of us need more faith. As I've said this before, Jesus said in Luke uh, 18, verse 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, we really find faith on the earth. Jesus prophesied there would be problems with faith in the end times. We need more faith. We all need to change. Tip number 7. 27, excuse me, 27. Change can make the impossible possible. Now what if what we want to go through is impossible? Go to 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now remember that during tests and trials to resist Satan, God will make a way for you to bear it. Turn uh, potentially destructive events into character building ones. Now items like weight loss and, and stopping smoking, if you're addicted to it, are very difficult. But those aren't impossible. Now items like an adult growing a foot and a half, is, uh, or one cubic, as Jesus talked about in Matthew uh, 6.27, uh, that's impossible uh, for an adult to do that uh, unless some strange hormonal thing happens. It's not going to happen. Uh, and it says in uh, John 9, 30, verse 33, that being born blind, if there's no medical intervention, that's impossible that you're going to see. These things are basically impossible. Sometimes we face the impossible because God believes we can handle it and it'll help us build character. Sometimes, though, we face the impossible to see how much it will motivate us to be closer to God. Now, sometimes that will work to get you to truly get closer to God. Sometimes people will get bitter. We don't want the root of bitterness to come in. Some tests and trials have to be taken one day at a time. Don't sell yourself short. For almost everything, or almost any, almost any problem, you can hold out at least another day. I'd like to go to uh, Matthew uh, 6, uh, verses 30, starting verse 31, read something Jesus said. Don't worry and tell yourself you cannot continue. Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, this is Jesus talking. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, Jesus says, don't say, okay, I can't endure this trial for months, years, weeks, or whatever. Jesus said, sufficient for the day is the trouble of itself. In other words... Take it one day at a time. And again, almost everything can be taken a day at a time. 
Now, I'd like to go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. We need to be careful not to say, look, other people in the church don't have this problem, other people in the world don't have this problem, and therefore I shouldn't have it. Remember, I read before about spiritual gifts, and we're all different, and we all have a different part to play. Paul also wrote uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves, compare themselves among themselves, are not wise. We've got to deal with the, the situation that is in front of us. But it's not always the same. Yes, some human being has had some similar tests, probably. That's why we read that before. But don't look in your circles, oh, that's just not, not it, and it's just not fair. God has a way of escape for you. Now, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 4, you're going to find out part of why we have some of the tests or trials that we have now. This is from another angle here. Uh, 1 Peter uh, 4, I'm going to start verse 17. First Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. What does that mean? It means judgment starts first on Christians. For if it begins first with us, what will it be the end for those who don't obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as the faithful Creator. Do what you can. Do good. So, you know, as Christians... Peter's telling us that we may encounter some problems others don't. Despite the problems, we're supposed to do good even when we're suffering. And as far as prayer goes, what if you want the impossible? Uh, there's a few different passages. I guess we'll go to Matthew uh, 19, verse 26, if you'd like. Matthew 19, uh, verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, in uh, Mark, I'm just going to read this, Mark 14, verse 36, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. You might say, well, that's fine for God, but I'm, imp I'm imperfect. And thus, it's, the impossible is not going to happen for me. Well, do you really believe the Bible? It says in uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. You might be telling yourself, and, and Paul wrote that, by the way. You might say, well, that's true for the apostle Paul. He was a great man of faith. But I'm a nobody, and I've sinned a lot. You don't know how bad I've sinned, so uh, God's not going to listen to me. Well, in Galatians 1.13, the Apostle Paul said he persecuted the church of God beyond measure. You probably didn't do anything worse than that. And even if you did, you can still repent. But the real point is, yes, through Jesus Christ, his Christians can do anything. I'd like to go to Psalm 103. Uh, starting in verse 2. To show you that this also includes healing. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, so if you're a sinner, we all are, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. See, he's merciful, even if you are a major sinner. Slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He's not always going to strive for, with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. So it may take some time. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Our sins deserve death. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. But you might say you or someone you're praying about hasn't been healed. 
While God does heal all diseases, He does so when He feels it will truly help somebody. Sometimes it's not clear why you don't get the answer you're expecting or even pleading for. Is this necessarily because you lack faith? No, not necessarily. I'd like to go to Second uh, uh, Corinthians 12 again. And this time, uh, verse 7. I'd like to go over something that happened with the Apostle Paul, the great man of faith, and wrote more books of the Bible than anybody. Second uh, Corinthians 12, starting in verse 7. Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given me, a measure of Satan, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that, I might, that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Understand that? My strength is made perfect in weakness. It helps humble us. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul says, I, when I'm physically weak, frequently means I'm spiritually strong. Now, why didn't God uh, heal, heal Paul? Because apparently it would have affected the, Paul the wrong way. Uh, this passage I was just reading in 2 Corinthians shows that either Paul or the people around him wouldn't have handled it right. Uh, maybe he couldn't have handled it right with his own character development. Or maybe it was because Paul did have the right type of character to endure, and God decided it was, it was best. Paul is an example for us. Could be that the suffering that we go through now will be examples for others. Maybe in this age, maybe in the millennium, we're kings and priests reigning with Christ. Now, Paul probably felt he could do God's work better if God would only heal him. Now, because of some statements in uh, Galatians, some think maybe this had to do with his vision. And since I mentioned before, Paul wrote more books of the New Testament or the Bible than anybody else, you'd think, obviously, he needs good eyesight to do that, especially back then. But God didn't heal him of that. Nor did Paul's uh, parent prayers heal everybody who he was involved with. For example, he said that uh, Timothy had a recurring stomach problem, and he left somebody called Trophimus in Miletum sick. So everybody didn't respond to, to, to Paul either. So if uh, we sent you to, if you've been anointed or we've sent you an anointed cloth, you don't get healed. Don't think, oh, well, if it was from Paul, it would have happened. Uh, not necessarily. Now, building character is more important to God and God's will than physical healing. It doesn't mean the impossible will not be done. Yet the experience of the Apostle Paul helps us demonstrate that God's ultimate will for you exceeds what you might prefer physically. You might think that you're unworthy for God to hear your prayers, but you know, all is sin and falling short of the glory of God. Uh, and it says in uh, 1 John, that's from Romans 3.23, it says in 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, uh, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. So we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us for all righteousness. If we say we haven't sinned, we make Him a liar and the truth is not in, in us. If you believe God and confess your sins, He will heal, heal you, or hear you. But you might have to develop character in other areas more than you think. So sometimes... Healing doesn't happen the way that you want in this age. Now the last tip, the end tip, tip 28. Close with amen. Jesus ended, ended the prayer he gave in Matthew 6 with the term amen. Amen stems from the verb meaning to support, confirm, or to rear up. Amen itself means truly. Uh, Christ often used the... Uh, word in the uh, New Testament in the, New King James, in the Old King James it's usually translated as verily basically the word signifies that you agree with what's stated before have the right attitude believe what you pray Amen now I'd like to, to go through a summary of the 28 tips I'm going to just read, uh, uh, read them all briefly uh, before I conclude 1. Pray to God the Father Two, worship God in truth. Three, believe God. Four, obey God. Do more than demons. Five, worship God in spirit. Six, 
Resist Satan. Seven, don't fight God. And again, these are all listed here. Uh, uh, probably going too fast, you can write them down. Eight, pray for others. Nine, pray for your needs. Ten, remember God's will and have your priorities in order. Eleven, uh, praying positions from the Bible. I would also add that those who intentionally pray toward the east, uh, like the heathen did toward the sun god, that's wrong. It doesn't mean if you happen to be facing east when you pray, that's, that that's a problem. It's not. But the Bible does talk about prayer positions and locations. Twelve, pray every day. Thirteen, remember forgiveness. Fourteen, recognize God's spirit. Fifteen, uh, pray for what the Bible says to pray for. Sixteen, ask for spiritual gifts. Seventeen, don't pray for show. Eighteen, obey the New Testament regarding uh, head coverings. Uh, Nineteen, ask often. Don't use vain repetitions, but be fervent. Twenty, if you're suffering or sick, pray for it. Twenty-one, pray for church leaders. 22, pray for secular leaders. 23, put Jesus in your prayers. 24, if you have the difficult, remember fasting. 25, pray with thanksgiving. 26, deal with secret sins and confess them. 27, change can make the impossible possible. Because you can do all things through Christ Jesus. With God, nothing's impossible. 28, close with amen. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, I want God to do things my way. That's why I pray. And as you keep quoting verses that I've got to confess my sins, pray for others, pray for God's will to be done, give thanks, fast, pray for the work. Those aren't the kind of tips that I was hoping for. Well, you can either believe the God of the Bible, or you don't. You can pray for your wants and needs, but you need to understand that prayer is intended to be more of a, more than, please give me this or give me that process. Study, review, and understand all the tips in this that we've been going over. Read the Bible. Pray, pray regularly to the Father. If you believe and will follow what the Bible says, God will answer your prayer. The 28 tips in this booklet should give you at least a start. And I'd like to close with James 4.17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. So pray, brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.